Welcome to the Really Know Your Customer podcast with your hosts, Betsy Westhafer and Tony Bodo. Join Betsy and Tony as they dive in with highly successful C-suite leaders who have grown successful organizations by creating a laser focus on listening to their customers and building deep customer relationships. Now, it's time to join Betsy and Tony for the Really Know Your Customer show. Welcome to the Really Know Your Customer podcast. My name is Tony Bodo, CEO of Tony Bodo International. And I'm Betsy Westhaper, CEO of the Congruity Group. Betsy, I am so excited to have David with us today because he brings out some amazing and interesting points. We talk about the customer journey. We talk about really knowing your customer in a lot of different ways. One point that just really hit home for me is this idea that you should be treating your buyers as customers. And we talk through this extensively in various ways throughout the conversation. But one thing that we really bring out is you have to reduce the risk of a buyer. The, the buyer is sitting there thinking, okay, what's the experience afterwards? Whether it's B2B or B2C, what's the experience going to be like afterwards? What do I not know? You know, their anxiety is rising. So that risk, that anxiety can actually be a huge obstacle to making sales. And so we talk in this about how do you potentially take the customer experience and move it forward so that the buyers can experience to some extent what it's like to be a customer, to lower that anxiety, to lower that risk, so they can more easily say yes. Yeah. And, and I like the point too, he made about because people are doing all their research ahead of time. It's really, by the time they get to you, it's not a, why should I buy from you? But a, how should I buy from you? Which I thought was fascinating. The other thing is I always enjoy the founder stories and, and how they were a husband, wife team that had a very small little company that has now morphed into this global, massive company. It's just very fascinating to me. And all of the stuff he's learned along the way that he shared in this episode, I think is fascinating. So with that, let's jump in and meet David Cicerelli. Welcome, David. We're so happy to have you on the show today. We can't wait for this conversation. Oh, great to be here. Thanks to you both. And uh, I agree. I think we're gonna have a great chat today. Yeah. So let's just dive in and get us up to speed and our audience up to speed on your career path, which is fascinating, by the way, and um, how you landed at where you are now and the work you're doing. Tell us about your clients. Just kind of level set everybody on on everything about you. Sure, Betsy. Well, it, well, it is a love story, but uh, I will uh, make sure we, I weave that one in. I grew up a fascination with all things sound. Uh, my mom and dad had, you know, a record player and a shortwave radio where I could tune into radio stations from around the world. So kind of had this interest uh, my whole life in sound. Uh, graduated from an audio engineering school and, and program and actually opened up a small recording studio of my own. And the studio, uh, actually, I got my name in the local newspaper on my birthday of all days. And it turns out that kind of introducing myself to the local business community, uh, one of the people who saw that article is now my mother-in-law. Um, and it's actually, she passed the article off to Stephanie, who's the co-founder of Voices.com. And Stephanie is, of course, my wife. Well, at the time, she was a classically trained singer. She'd sing at weddings and special events. And uh, her mom cut out that newspaper article and said, why don't you get your singing repertoire recorded at this new studio that opened? up. So both came down to the studio, you know, chaperoned by their mother, of course. And we ended up uh, recording that singing repertoire. But because of that newspaper article, there were other small businesses in the city that wanted a female voice. They wanted for some local radio commercials, uh, you know, some phone system greetings. And uh, I only knew one girl in the city who I just met the other day. So I gave Stephanie a call and I said, listen, I'll be the engineer. If you could be the female voice talent and we'll split the money 50 50. So that's how we ended up started working together. And of course, one thing led to another where uh, we fell deeply in love and, and, and got married and, and uh, still are, of course, today. So that was really the, the genesis of how it began. But because of that kind of initial, you know, seed of 
of work that we began to you know cultivate together if you will there were we put up a website and that website soon attracted other freelance voice actors people who did you know celebrity impersonations you know narration for audiobooks and documentaries uh, you know commercials really everything you can imagine different languages as well too and then and concurrently there would be clients who would discover this website in the earlier days and say I work at a video production company I see the name of a voice that you have on there and I can hear them but how do I actually hire them and that was you know the the you know what we call in you know entrepreneurial circles right the the aha moment right where we realize well why do we get out of the production business ourselves yes we we have a number of talent listed on this website let's step back from the production business and reinvent ourselves as a marketplace where we connect that voice buying client with the voice selling talent. And that's what we've been doing for the better part of 15 years, just kind of holding on to that simple idea of connecting buyer and seller of this one creative services, uh, the power of the human voice. And, and you've grown significantly since then. So tell us a little bit about that growth in the entrepreneurial piece of all of this. Sure. Well, we, uh, you know, was, we did start as a, as a husband, wife, co-founding team. And uh, like most growth stories, they're kind of long and slow for about a decade until um, a number of years ago. You know, we were actually a, a, up a, a words of a hundred employees, hundred full-time employees, serving you know millions of uh, you know community members and, and people on the marketplace from around the world. Uh, we were successful in uh, raising some institutional capital uh, from uh, Morgan Stanley, a private in uh, private equity group out of. San Francisco. And so up to that point, you know, we, we bootstrapped, you know, by selling a product and service and, you know, taking on some bank loans and then paying them off and getting a bigger loan uh, for working capital. But we realized in order to uh, kind of push forward to that next chapter. We, we needed to professionalize the business by stronger, more sophisticated investors who could help us grow, um, also help us complete our first acquisition of a, another company, but also establish a board of directors, which we hadn't really had before and set up a, a leadership team, an executive team. Uh, and so there was a lot of learnings uh, through that experience where it just wasn't, you know, kind of a, you know, a co-founders kind of running the whole thing. I think we recognized the importance of having a leadership team and, and learning to delegate all things that uh, f for some founders are uh, tremendously difficult to do. Uh, I myself being no different, but I hopefully I've improved that uh, aspect along the way. And, um, but, you know, still are actively involved in, in uh, all aspects of the business. And David, your client base is just all over the place, right? It's, you don't focus on an industry or anything like that. It's just a big, huge marketplace, correct? That, that's it. I mean, there's really two different customer groups, you know, the voice talent uh, of whom there's well over, you know, 2 million registered voice talent who range from those who are aspiring, you know, who maybe been told their whole life, you've got a great voice, you know, maybe you've been in acting classes or, you know, public speaking and you've got a knack for this, but it's more than just having the God given gift of a great voice. You need the audio recording technology. You also need to know how to kind of breathe life into that script to kind of create a character. And so we, we have uh, one kind of customer group, if you will, being those talent. And then on the other side would be those clients, as you mentioning, not really a particular industry. Maybe if one stands out the advertising industry, because they create a lot of content for ad campaigns or perhaps a product launch um, as well too. And those, I mean, there's 160 countries, you know, of clients from around the world. I, you know, I'd put it down to if there's, if there's an advertising business or a broadcast business, broadcasting industry in a particular country, uh, there's probably a need for voiceovers. And uh, that's what we, uh, you know, really aim to provide is access to that talent to help those brands and organizations be able to tell their story. Could be to educate, could be to simply inform or otherwise entertain their audience. It's so fascinating to, to really think about the, the breadth of what you do. I mean, Betsy and I have this podcast, of course, which helps generate business. And this is one of the reasons we do it besides the educational side. And so I kind of lovely, love to have you dive into that aspect of there's kind of a, in, in a pre-sales situation, we've noticed this trend really growing over the last couple of years, but uh, we were talking, doing an interview yesterday and the, and our guest said that 80% of the decision is made in B2B sales prior to them picking up the phone or sending an email to the company to say, I want to, I want to talk about, you know, buying something from you. So 
in your, with, with what you do, how does that play in? Cause we had a really interesting conversation about this in the prep session. I want to go there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I completely agree with that comment that the, the buying decision and that discovery is happening before the customers really reaching out to the company. And so which case we need to be thinking about having our brand, you know, present in a number of channels way earlier on in the cycle. And there's this notion, you know, the difference between demand generation and demand capture. And often we think about demand capture. What did somebody do right before they signed up or registered or fill out the lead form? And, you know, it says Google search as an example is where they came from. But in reality, that journey of, you know, awareness and interest and that started perhaps weeks, if not months earlier. And that can come as simple as I'm thinking about perhaps starting a podcast of my own. I might be listening to what equipment, other podcasts about what equipment do I need? Um, you know, what are the different forms of podcasts? Is it an interview based? Is it a monologue? Is it more of a panel? Um, do we do video? Do we do audio? So there's a lot of questions that arise that in this almost like education phase. And I think the customer is ultimately on a journey and too often businesses try to put themselves as the hero in that journey and talking about that they were founded in 1948 and you know we made it through this era and that era and kind of the whole back the customer doesn't care they want to know they want to actually know how are you going to help them and but more importantly your your position as a as a brand or even a thought leader is to be their guide in helping them achieve their goals and so that uh, posture of being a guide it means that you're supportive. You're putting out a lot of information that once was held behind kind of gated content where you have to fill out a form to get access to it or sign up to speak to somebody at the company. Those organizations that are winning right now are, are in effect content producers. They're publishing that content and making it freely accessible so that by the time the customer actually wants to engage, they're all really well informed. They're asking, they're reaching out to your sales team or account executives more about how do I buy from you instead of should I buy from you? And I think that's a big distinction. If you can get somebody all the way to that point, we've generated all the demand. Now we're just capturing it, you know, and, and, you know, and really guiding them through the rest of that, uh, the rest of that process of actually engaging with your organization. I love that because, you know, I think you get two different schools of thought about the gated community thing. And I, I, when, when we were chatting earlier, I love that you said not a big fan of the gated community and, or I mean the gated content. And I think that just freely giving and helping someone get to that, how do I buy versus why should I buy? If they're not going to be your customer, they're not going to be your customer, right? So mm -hmm. why not help somebody at least get the information they need, whether or not they're going to be your customer or not? And this is where, you know, comparison charts, tips, tutorials, just putting this information out in whatever form factor your business wants to be you know, you're comfortable with in terms of being a publisher. If you have an subject matter expertise in your organization, they really ought to be the one who's the publisher of the content or the spokesperson for your organization. And what I mean by that is it's so much more authoritative if that knowledge expert is the one who's on as guests on other podcasts, whose name has the byline on the articles and tutorials. You almost have an affinity with the person, even though you're buying from an organization, you end up following those people, you see them on LinkedIn, you're having almost this one-on-one -on -one conversation. You feel like you have a relationship with that, with that individual, even though ultimately you might be, as I say, buying from and engaging that organization as a whole. Uh, and so if, if you enjoy being on podcasts, there's lots of opportunities to be on podcasts. If, if more writing is your thing and you want to articulate your thoughts, maybe doing, you know, art, either your own blog or on medium, or possibly even just being frequent and consistent on LinkedIn. I've seen a number of people build massive audiences, just being uh, consistent uh, publishing on LinkedIn. 
or long form kind of trends or research reports, there's lots of form factors that uh, that, that information that you create and your kind of uh, your industry expertise can uh, can shine through that that one individual who ultimately becomes uh, becomes the spokesperson. It's really fascinating because on this show, we talk about really knowing your customer, but what you're talking about is allowing the customer to really know their supplier, their partner and building that trusted relationship. And it's, it's funny because I know Betsy's had this experience. I've had this experience where we go speak at an event and we've done some, probably done a podcast with the organization before we go speak at their event. We've probably written an article for them or a blog post for them. We've done a number of things. So when we get there, people feel like they know us. They come up, start talking. We're like, who are you? Did I forget who you were? You know, it's, it's almost like a little, a, a minor celebrity status, but really it becomes out of your expertise. So I love what you're saying, because I think that's a really, it's a really interesting way to think about it. And then companies, and I, I want to tie this back to the voice talent that you have, because in a lot of companies, they have these experts and many times they don't, they don't allow the experts to come to the top, right? It's like the root, the, they're a thought leader organization, but also not everyone's necessarily the best writer. They might not be the best speaker. So how would you, how would you go about helping a company like that really bring the expertise out, but maybe if they don't have the right voice? Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's definitely a skill that's learned over time. Um, like most things, not everyone's going to be feel comfortable being kind of, you know, front of house right there on, on stage. And if, if that's the case, I'd still challenge to find that person who will be the known entity that the customers can identify with. Now, if it's, and sometimes that's, you know, sometimes that is hiring someone outside of the organization and bringing them on or either on is a, you know, a contract or kind of uh, interim basis to, you know, be a host uh, even if, 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 you know, of a series of webinars or a series of broadcasts, perhaps being a host of, of a podcast, you know, without necessarily being, uh, being front of house and, and on stage, but wh where I'd say it kind of differs from voice talent, voice talent are there to be, you know, in, in a lot of ways, they are an audio ambassador, but they're not the thought leader and, and subject matter expert. It's really for like commercial content where it's an advertisement or perhaps, you know, internal corporate training or a phone system. You are there to find somebody who, you know, represents your brand. But I, I you know, th there's often not a name associated with it and they're not an employee of the company. So um, that's where, you know, I would, I would differentiate a couple examples who of people people that I that are employees, there's a fellow um, with uh, Deloitte, you know, one of the big accounting firms, and his name's Duncan Stewart. And Duncan every year puts out kind of a state of technology, his predictions for the year. He does a whole roadshow uh, as well. And, you know, the same, you know, uh, you know, deck where he runs through all the trends, a number of kind of large banks and, and accounting firms have a similar type of format, but you end up looking forward to this event of, oh, Duncan's coming up. You see him, you know, he kind of, almost his presence and his profile rises during that time where he's relaying the trends and the beauty of kind of having that happen year after year is you can say, here's what I got right last year. Here's what I got wrong. And here's where we are. Very, very humble fellow. And, um, I've, you know, great admiration. I've seen him a number of times, uh, presenting. So if you can find someone like that within your organization, you know, it could be, uh, and, and yet maybe they aren't ready for, uh, you know, to be on a podcast or on video, perhaps a media training might be kind of worthwhile, um, as well, but there's, that's, if you have somebody, if you don't, and you're, you're thinking, I still want to position our organization as being, a, a, as being a, an expert in the field and a leader in technology and innovation and kind of at the cutting edge of the current trends and developments. You could be, as I say, work with someone outside. I, and I'm, I'm reluctant to use the word influencer because I don't want to make it sound like it's a, like a, just purely a social media play. But, you know, we all know who the, for every industry, there's going to be one person who's a prolific blogger, whatever they publish gets, you know, hundreds of comments on LinkedIn. It, there's, there's probably somebody that most folks follow for every given industry. It could be a, a, a physician who's out there publishing. It could be a, you know, someone who does deep dives on research or a strategist, whoever that person is, maybe try to find a way to work with them in some type of partnership. If you don't have that expertise in house. 
Tony and I are coming out with a new book next month, and I've been kind of pre-talking it up to some of our friends and clients and prospects and that kind of thing. And we've had several replies, like, when's it coming out on Audible? So, you know, that's that trend is really changing things. And so what else do you see out there that in the say two to five year frame that you could see really shifting in terms of work that relates to what you do? Well, one of the, one of the trends absolutely is the shift from pure video to video and audio and even audio as a standalone channel. I mean, there's uh, you know, I've, I've did a quick a couple Googling to find the stat on this. I know there's an entire segment of the population that is a, you know, an auditory learner. They learn best by listening. Um, I would consider myself one of those. I'm sure there's uh, people who like podcasts, who like audiobooks, who like to l- learn by even hearing someone kind of read it out, or that's how they absorb the content best, the information best. And so that's actually one of the things. Uh, and so the stat is, there's, it's as much as a third of the population, it was, uh, you know, 30% of the population globally learns best by listening, in which case, what are the, what's the content that we have out there that will help that, you know, cohort, if you will, to actually learn about your organization. Um, and so that's where, uh, you know, content, you know, if you've written the manuscript, tr- that's, that's the hard work. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure you've learned Betsy, um, and, and Tony that the hard work is creating the manuscript and then converting it into an audiobook is by comparison, uh, you know, a relatively trivial, um, exercise. So, Audible, uh, for those who may not be aware, is actually an Amazon company. They were independent for years. I think Amazon recognized the parallels between a lot of people prefer buying the you know the audio version, and so for a four four or five hour book, which probably kind of a hundred and eighty to two hundred and twenty pages somewhere in that neighborhood, um, might be four hours of actual runtime. But when it comes to recording it, the rule of thumb is three times as long as recording it. So an audiobook narrator could be, you know, you might be looking at kind of, you know, um, 10 to 12 to 15 hours in the studio, in a studio, which might be over a series of days because the voice just gets, you know, recording an audiobook is like a marathon. It's not the monster truck rally. It's not the, you know, hard sell car commercial. This is, which would be a sprint. This is the marathon over, over a number of days, in which case there's a couple options for, um, for authors, either they record it themselves. And if you have a, you know, massive following and the people want that, as you said, you've built up um, a community around you where they want to hear from you um, because they've heard you, they're already familiar with your voice. That's absolutely an option. And, and in some ways much encouraged because people have, a, as I say, an affinity for hearing um, and knowing the authors. If on the other hand, maybe that whole uh, task seems a little daunting, then of course, working with an, uh, an audiobook narrator um, would be a great option. And it probably somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, $300 per finished hour of, of content. Uh, and I mean, th- these are the, the folks who do this, do it a lot. And therefore, you know, there's not a lot of edits and retakes that kind of, they know how to pace themselves, to stay in character, if you will, um, throughout that entire time. So, um, that's just to kind of give a, give an example of, um, some options for, uh, other book publishers or content producers who maybe have a manuscript and are considering creating an audio version. And you're right. Audible would be a great outlet to, uh, to be able to publish to. What I love about this, when I think about that experience, customer experience side of it is, you know, if you, if you are really getting to know your customer and you're really understanding, are they visual learners? Are they auditory learners? Are they kinesthetic learners? Like it, it's like, I could create a white paper, but that's only going to get absorbed by a small percentage of the audience. So how do I turn that white paper into essentially that content into an audio format or into a presentation, right? We, we kind of see the presentation formats come out. You got graphs and charts and that, but I think there's more and more on this audio content that people are going to want, because I can listen as I listen, as I'm driving to work, I can listen as I'm making dinner, right? I can absorb a lot more content. So I'm, 
I'm really fascinated by this because really that whole pre-sales and it doesn't just have to be pre-sales. It can be the how to afterwards. Right. But if there's so much content that companies have that they could just essentially translate into audio or into audio and video put together that would make their, their value to the customer go up dramatically. Oh yeah. I mean, I view, absolutely. I view this as you're repurposing content you've already created. You probably have even identified what are the, you know, looking at something like Google analytics, what are the top pages on our website? What is content that's already seems to be resonating um, where there's a number of page views on our blog? Well, then maybe that makes sense to create a video or to have that as a theme in an upcoming uh, podcast, you know, or have an entire talk on it on your podcast. Or again, someone who maybe let's go out and find an, a guest or an expert to speak to that as a, as a special guest on our, on our podcast. So um, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I love what you said about the um, ability to, you know, multitask or ability to, to do another kind of concurrent activity. You know, Brian Tracy years ago described, uh, well, it was, it was ref referencing books on tape uh, to go back a number of years, but he was uh, describing this as, you know, listening to, you know, cassettes in the car. So tapes in the car as being the university on wheels. And I love that. It's just, and, and I find myself in this, in the same boat where uh, in, in the same situation where if, if I'm in the car, I, you know, I enjoy listening to podcasts on the drive in and drive back. Uh, interestingly, you know, a lot of podcasts are in that 20 to 30 minute range because it is the typical commute. It's the morning commute there. And then, uh, the, the evening commute on the way home. Um, so I think there's, you know, it's more than a coincidence that, um, you know, people like to listen for a period of time to complete some type of task. The other place I find myself and maybe others as well too, whether it's working out or walking the dog, uh, you know, around the, around the neighborhood. Um, so there's almost this desire to, kind of go deep on a subject in that kind of customer discovery phase. I'm learning all I can about this particular subject. And, you know, a lot of people actually do searches on Spotify for, to find podcasts or do searches on the Apple, you know, um, you know, a podcast directory and podcast store, if you will, to see, Hey, is there any content that's out there? And I found a number of leader, you know, leaders and kind of, you know, prolific, you know, guests and speakers who are sharing their knowledge freely. Often it's in like the entire book summary is shared on, you know, as they do almost like a book tour, but a podcast tour and they, and you can really learn a lot of information quite quickly. Um, hearing again, directly from the expert. I think too, for me, it depends on what the content is, because like, for example, if it's something I really want to understand and study and think about, I do better reading it and highlighting, but if it's something where I just want kind of a cursory knowledge of something, then I'll listen to podcasts on the way into work. And, and the other thing about what you said that struck me is just thinking about this whole commute thing because of the last two years where people weren't commuting into the office and what, how does that change how people are taking in this content? One thing I wanted to touch on that we had uh, talked about previously is just the, the fact that the customer journey is nonlinear. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, this, um, there's a fellow who's, you know, really in, in I'm going to say enlightened me to this notion of, uh, his name's Chris Walker. And he's, he's talked a lot about this concept called the dark funnel. And in effect, you know, historically as marketers, we think of the customer journey as being very linear. You start at, you know, awareness, you have some interest, you make a decision and, you know, you've, you become a customer, if you will. And, but in reality and, and software, you know, attribution, uh, attribution software would suggest that, and that's how often we design, we try to design these customer journeys to be very linear. And then that software attribution says somebody came from Google search when in reality, their customer journey started with, you know, um, some type of interest that they had, maybe a, a problem they're facing. And it might begin with a very 
topical based search, very information based search, but not maybe on Google. Maybe it's actually the search begins on YouTube or perhaps um, they're thinking about this and like, well, who are the experts in the field? Let me go look on Apple Podcasts. Let me go see on Spotify. Are this, who's talking about this? Who might have a good solution where I can learn more? Am I understanding the problem in the right way? And so there's a number of marketing channels that are completely invisible to attribution software. Attribution software says what happened. I like to think of it as like a, like a tattoo or a stamp that happens right when someone fills out that lead form, that customer lead form or the sales lead form. But what are all of the touch points that happened previously? Somebody who participates, they read something on LinkedIn. They didn't do anything, but they read it. It influenced, but it didn't it's not captured anywhere. Listening to a mention on a podcast, participating in a Twitter spaces, you know, conversation, perhaps even watching a YouTube video, you're learning as you go. And it's, it's a little all over the place. You know, the, and a personal example is uh, my daughter and I are looking to do, uh, to hike the Camino trail, which is, you know, from it's, it's about 500 kilometers, um, about 300 or so miles, um, in across uh, the Northern Spain. And we've never done a long, a long, uh, extended hike before. So we're learning, we've you know bought a few books, we've watched a movie, we watched some videos, but at no point, you know, is, are any of those, you know, is the airline going to know that that's what we're trying to do until we're like book the tickets. And so there's, there is this, or even purchase any of that equipment. They don't understand the journey that we're on, but we're just in this, almost this sponge type, you know, I'm going to soak up information wherever I can get it. And so the, how we tie this back to a B2B experience is recognizing that your customers aren't going to look for information just on your website or just on your blog. There's probably an entire collection of, of places to publish that are off site and therefore relatively invisible when you actually go to try to run marketing reporting on where did our customers come from. So the way that a lot of people and us included have been getting around this is to ask a simple question. How did you hear about us? When they go to fill out that form, and this is important that it's a free form text field because we don't want to introduce any bias where the first option says search and then everyone just defaults and clicks to search. It's a free form text field. And sure, we see things. I was shocked. We actually had about 20% of people saying that they heard about voices.com on TikTok. We have no TikTok presence. So somewhere somebody is creating videos saying, if you want to become a voice talent, this is a good place to do it. You can create a profile. That is completely invisible to us. We were unaware until we asked that question. Um, same thing with a lot of a lot of people saying they watched videos on YouTube. So this notion that there's these might be perceived as very consumer oriented marketing channels. They're obviously people. I mean, listening and learning and watching as part of that, as you say, Betsy, a non-linear customer journey and ultimately um, expressing that interest at that moment that they're, that they're ready to buy. So I would encourage to kind of put a bow on it. I would encourage businesses to think about new channels, perhaps run an experiment, try something different, but, but recognize that people are learning way earlier on and you're really best off being present earlier on in that kind of initial awareness phase where there's hardly any competition by the time they're on G2 crowd or software advice, they're literally stacking you up against all your competitors. I think you're much better off considering where you, uh, you know, being in the mind of your, uh, of your prospects and hopefully your future customer, if you can be doing that way earlier on in the journey. I just had a funny thought when you were talking about this, thinking about how times have changed. Cause I remember years and years and years ago, if somebody were inclined to really dig into the research before they made a purchase, it was waiting for the right edition of consumer reports, you know, or going to the library and looking through back issues of consumer reports to see how they rated. And now to look at all the different ways that you can research 
before you purchase. It's just fascinating to me. Tony, I think we have time for one last question. So Perfect, I'll turn it I over to you. One last question on, on my side here. So uh, one of the things you said very early on is that customers, um, and let me find the quote here. When customers come to you today, they're asking, how do I buy versus how should I versus should I buy from you? Right. And, and what struck me is one of the trends that I'm seeing again and again is that consumers are going out there, whether it's B2B or B2C, it doesn't matter. They're going out there and they're saying, okay, show me the how-to video. Show me what it's going to be like once I buy, do they have the information I need or not? And, and I'll give an example. So I'm, I'm using, I just got this thing called a super note. I don't know if you have any, one of these little tablets, I just got it. I love it. And Betsy got one and she actually convinced me to get one a couple months ago. And I'm sitting here, I, I reached out to her and I said, is there like a how-to manual on this thing? Had I known in advance, like I found some great reviews, but they don't have, as far as I can tell, there's not a lot of really good education of how to use this. And that's an example. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade. I'm going to learn how to use this, but there's an opening in the market for them as an example, where any other competitors come and say, here, here's how to use this and all these how-to videos. And they could take market share very rapidly. And I'm seeing the same thing happen in other industries where some companies are thinking forward, like, let's show them what the experience is before they even get there, what it's going to be like to be a customer. Are, are you seeing that in, in the work that you're doing? Are companies coming to you and saying, hey, we need to up-level, we need to get our how-to videos, our, our consumer videos, your customer videos afterwards, really high caliber because we recognize it's marketing. Absolutely. I mean, I, I kind of delineated between, you know, pre-sales and post-sales and the, the shift I think you're describing, Tony, is almost treating prospects as if they're already customers. Just put the information in advance. Do I really need to go through a sales demo, um, you know, a discovery call, a sales demonstration, sit on the call for an hour before I can actually see how this thing works and let me so there's a benefit of of course the the do it yourselfers just want to want the free trial of a piece of software but even if it's a process i'm actually seeing a lot more companies create a video to describe our methodology especially service based organizations describing our you know our our approach to you know publicity our approach to doing cost accounting and they develop this framework and then create videos on here's what you can expect to um, experience once you've signed on with us so that's on a service base absolutely if it's if it's hardware and there is something to show you know you need to, you do a benefit from educating your customers in advance because why it eliminates the anxiety over well, what happens when I buy the thing right I the more questions that you can answer in advance maybe not everybody wants to uh, you know go deep on that but those who do you're just building and kind of firming up that bond and that that desire to kind of go deep and probably creating fanatics along the way of people who learn about you know your product and services and are actually in a position um, to uh, to tell others and, and to share that experience um, as well so uh, I, I I agree with what you're what you're sh sharing and I think it's a very astute observation of this notion of kind of pulling that what would be historically kind of e-learning or customer onboarding, uh, pulling that information forward so that prospects can also see it and factor that into their decision-making process as well. David, this conversation could go on for hours, but we know you're a busy guy. And so we're going to let you go, but this has been great. Thank you so much. Before we do let you go, um, as you know, on our show, we like to let our guests give out a shout out to an organization or nonprofit or somebody that's doing good in the world. And um, at this time that we're going through right now, we need a lot more awareness of those organizations that are doing good things. So is there an organization or charity that you'd like to shine a spotlight on? Well, well, one I think that is here in Canada is also in the U.S. is the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. Uh, in the U.S., it's the American Foundation for the Blind. Mostly, again, because I think there's just a there's a shortage of um, resources that are available for those who you know may be challenged in, in such an area. And you know, we're here to you know put forth good messages in the world and, and hopefully make the world a more accessible place through the power of the human voice. That is our mission. And so these, uh, these couple of organizations certainly, um, align, uh, align to that from our perspective. So just wanted to, as you said, give them a shout out. Uh, thank you so much, David. We really appreciate it. Tony, any final comments? 
Now, this has been this has been awesome. I will let David go because, like you said, I know he's busy. He's got a lot of things to get back to. And uh, but, David, thank you. This has been fantastic. Yeah, Pleasure. so Pleasure much, so much good information. And we look forward to staying in touch with you, David. Absolutely, and best of luck on the book release and the book launch. Ah, thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Betsy, this is just such a fantastic interview. One of the things that stands out for me, and this is not something we've talked about on this show before, but there's an element of really knowing your customer that David hits on here, specifically really knowing, I would say, their learning style. Are they an audible audio learner? Are they a kinesthetic learner? Are they a, a visual learner? And then taking your content that you have, repurposing it in a way so that it resonates with them. If you think about that, I think the, the statistic you mentioned was 30% of people are audio-based learners. So if you have a white paper and you haven't converted that to an audio, you could be missing 30% of your likely customers. Yeah, exactly. And I love how he talks so much, not about just what his company does, but really educating people on how best to get out there and also he made a point about the gated content kind of thing. And I really like that he's thinking differently about that because, you know, everybody tells you, oh, you got to capture their email. You got to do this. You got to do this to get past this, this gate, so to speak, so that you get something for it. And I really like his mentality of, you know, put it out there, help people. The ones that it works for will find you and will have the conversation with you and become your customers. And that's Honestly, that's how I've always felt about it. And I, I get that you need emails for marketing and that kind of thing, but I just really like the mindset of putting this content out there and then know it, trusting the process that the people that want to find what you do will find you and will become your customers. So with that, thank you again for joining us on the Really Know Your Customer podcast. We so appreciate our audience. And if you uh, like this episode and like our show, please give it a like and set your notification bell so that you can find out when we have a new episode coming out. Until the next time, we will see you on the Really Know Your Customer podcast. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Really Know Your Customer. We hope you gained a lot of value from being here today. If you want to learn more about the work Betsy and Tony do to help their clients thrive, visit Betsy at thecongruitygroup.com and Tony at TonyBodo.com. See you next time on the Really Know Your Customer Show.